I'm David Lafriere and grew up in Metairie, Louisiana, in New Orleans, Louisiana, both sort of. And uh, I kind of stumbled onto playing bass because there was a band uh, in town that needed a bass player. So I basically just lied to them and told them that I played the bass. And uh, but there's there was I had an uncle that played bass. There's a few bass players in our family, so I knew like I could hit my uncle up for his bass, which was a PVT forty, and. Uh, you know, start playing in their band. And I had already kind of had an inclination towards bass anyway. I'd been playing guitar for a long time and knew I wasn't really a guitar player, but didn't really know. I'd been through a bunch of instruments and didn't know what my instrument was. Um, so, yeah, once I started playing with that band, then I knew that that was my deal. That was, you know, that I was a bass player. I started playing in high school, and then uh, once I graduated from high school, moved to Athens, Georgia, and wasn't re didn't really know about the music scene there wasn't really looking to play a lot of music right then i just wanted to like wash dishes in a restaurant or something read books and like really not do much of anything just for a year or something a little while what ended up happening was before i had gone to town to visit beforehand and met these people on the street who were a band and getting ready to make a record and didn't have a bass player so I told them that I was a bass player and that I was going to move here from New Orleans. And I think that they just felt like, oh, well, if you're a bass player from New Orleans, then you must be good. <laughs> so they hired me then to play on their record, like on the following month. So I moved up, actually moved into their house, stuck, played on their record, hit it off with the studio manager, and ended up like assisting him and sort of being like a house musician at his place. And uh, yeah, and then and then everything else. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think there's, there is something to it because there's so many people that have like this sort of greasiness or swing or whatever in common, you know. I mean, every region has its thing, you know. Um, but yeah, I think growing up there, especially uh, George Porter Jr., the fact that he played on so many recordings, the, the meters, all of them, played on so many recordings as a session band. So there's one personality of a sound, right, for Alan Toussaint. And, but then, as a completely different band, those same people um, made their own records and used their instruments in these so many unconventional ways, you know, but still within what's traditional, you know. Uh, in, in a lot of respects. <clears throat> George Porter Jr. playing the way that he did where like he would, you know, instead of having other instruments do it, or at least this is my take on it, like because there's such a, a you know, small band, a fourth piece band, each person would play the role of different instruments, mm -hmm. you know, like filling in arrangement ideas. And uh, maybe just as much as any kind of a feel thing or just being around, you know, that slippery kind of a feel, that kind of like melodic and like some of the atonal stuff that he did, you know, all that like non-conventional stuff, I think that rubbed off on me in a big way. And yeah. Willie like, Weeks, so. yeah, in a really big way also. I grew up listening to uh, David Bowie was somebody I was really into when I was growing up. So without really, there was a lot of, stuff that uh there's a lot of music that i grew up listening to that willie had played on and you know it wasn't until later until i was in my 20s that i started to realize like all these all these recordings are the same guy and uh it was kind of from um ricky lee jones first record was that was the record where i learned who willie weeks was and then started putting together um how many, how, just how ubiquitous he is, you know. Um, but I, I, it's so frustrating trying to name, like, uh, influences, you know, I mean, uh, because there's so many, <laughs> yeah. yeah, James Jamerson, for sure, you know. Um, uh, Tony Levin, you know, like the uh, Double Fantasy record, mm -hmm. some of the John Lennon recordings. Yeah. yeah. Um, like before I knew who Tony Levin was or had heard his name, that plane, like that was bass playing that I noticed, you know, um, Ronnie Lane, <clears throat> you know, oh, the yeah. faces, 
Like again, kind of a non-conventional approach, right. but still always, always filling the role of the bass, but doing stuff that is just sort of like now it might not sound like it's out of left field, but then it was out of left field, you know. As I lived in Athens, Georgia for about nine years and played in a lot of local bands. And, uh, you know, there are like open mic nights and stuff like that. There's one little place I would have a jazz night and there's a little blues band that would play somewhere else. And so for being as small of a community as it is, there's a lot of musicians and artists of every ilk there. So it was pretty easy to stay there and just play all the time. Um, but I'd also commute to Atlanta and uh, there were people there that I'd work with and that got to be a much more regular thing to, uh, to where it was kind of, I needed to, I needed to figure out if I was going to move to Atlanta, like what, you know, yeah. uh, so, which I ended up doing. I moved, uh, uh, well, in Athens, there, another band that I played with for a little while, which people still come up to me and ask me about is a, a band called Vigilantes of Love. And, uh, uh, which actually Travis McNabb, that drummer, plays in Sugarland now. Oh, okay. He's kind of had his own. He's from Louisiana as well. Um, and we've known each other for a long time. But um, yeah, Vigilantes was sort of the first band that I played in that had some amount of like national commercial, you know, attention. Mm -hmm. And um, AAA radio was kind of the big thing with that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, went after that, played with a band called Billy Pilgrim for a while that was, you know, just did some recordings and uh, they did a few tours, but that was another, that was like my second sort of oh, okay. step into like doing national tours yeah. and a record that was on a major label. But um, yeah, I moved up here to Nashville for a little bit, uh, loved the the scene, you know, playing and everything, uh, but ended up moving back to Atlanta. In 96 I moved up here, moved back to Atlanta in 90, at the second half of 96. and really just did a lot of session work in town and playing gigs at night in town and did a little some touring but not really all that much you know the session thing the studio thing was really happening at that time pretty well you know it, enough to keep it really busy and then show wise it's just very easy to be playing most nights of the week there you know um and that's where like i ended up uh Sean Mullins had asked me to play on one of his records, which ended up being, uh, you know, a huge hit, the Lullaby record. Oh, yeah, right. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of my favorite records that I've played yeah, that's on. A great Part of what I like about that record is it totally represented what was going on right then. Like, it really is uh, direct, kind of, you know, where you smell something and it brings you back to another place mm -hmm. in time. That record sounds like what was, you know, what it was like then, which is very nice, I think. Mm -hmm. John had met a guy named Clay Cook uh, at uh, Berkeley, and Clay grew, had grown up in Atlanta. Um, while they were at Berkeley, I think that was right about the time when uh, Sean's song Lullaby was really blowing up. So Clay, I think Clay had talked John into moving down to Atlanta, or something to that effect. Anyway, I, or maybe John talked Clay into it, dropping out of school, actually. I think it's probably more like it. And uh, so they moved to Atlanta because Clay had, you know, friends and connections here and stuff. And uh, so they could just start playing. Lo-Fi Masters was the name of that band. So once they had moved to town, John had said something to a mutual friend of ours, uh, who I think John was working for at the time, that he wanted to, like the bass player that played on that lullaby song, that was the kind of bass playing he wanted. And... Um, so our mutual friend was like, oh, I know, you know, I know him. Like, I'll introduce you to him. You guys should definitely meet. So, yeah, we just kind of played tag for a few months of, uh, I would be out of town while he was playing a show and, you know, but we ended up having a bunch of mutual friends that were both telling us we needed to meet each other. And it was pretty immediate, like, you know, we met and started talking, like, in the first few minutes, it was just one of those things where it's like, you know, like, oh, okay, like, we're friends. Like, this is, you know, uh this is game on, this will be fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, we really just started playing at each other's apartments. And um, uh, we played at, actually that mutual friend, we played at one of their parties. Mm -hmm. and I think we played, we honestly played 
for about five hours straight. Oh, wow. Like we took a little break and like, I think I had a beer and like John, you know, like we had snacks or something, uh -huh. <laughs> but like we kind of played out the end of the party because we were just sort of like riffing on like, you know, oh yeah, you, you, do you know this, do you know this, you know, it's just fun. And that's really how it started was just, you know, kind of uh, kicking around playing because it was fun. I think there's a nice little period of time that probably, I think it happens for most anyone that finds commercial success with something that was organic like that. Mm -hmm. But then when you're in the industry, you know, there's certain standards that we all adhere to. Right. Um, so that little period of time where like, you know, people are wanting to hear what it is that you're doing. So you just keep doing what you're doing, you mm -hmm. know? And then uh, as the next batch of material starts coming up, as, you know, like in our case, like once you start adding a drummer, you know, or another guitar player or any other element, you know, then uh, uh, I don't want to say it moves on to being something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, you go from the two of you up to, what, nine-piece band? Yes. You know, that's a very, like, very different, you know, beast. Yeah. In and of itself. Yeah, the duo thing, we kind of had... Uh, part of what was cool about it was that we could sort of play in this way where John could just have his stream of consciousness and I wouldn't get in his way, mm. you know, or at least I hope not. <laughs> if I saw YouTube's back, I'm sure I would disagree with myself. <laughs> but, you know, it was sort of like him being able to play solo, but mm -hmm. with the low end yeah. covered. So the bigger than my body tone, um, that credit really has to go to Jack Joseph Puig more than I can really take it. Um, I had a little P bass that I thought would be cool to play on it and uh, uh, split the signal, one through an Avalon U5 and just left that alone. And, um, and then the other, I was gonna run through a, a fat drive which is built by SIB, something I built, Rick Hamill, which uh, I love the stuff that Rick Hamill makes. Uh, and that was really as far as I had gone with it, and I thought that sounded pretty good, and so did Jack. But he also ran me ran my signal through an AC30, and he sacrificed the AC30. I think well one good time, but a couple of times on that record, and you know, uh, playing pushing bass through something like that, it sounds great and it just tears it up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he like uh, he wrestled with an AC30 to get that tone and. Uh, he did a bunch of stuff that I don't even know what he did. But uh, yeah, that bass tone, which is so monster and so many people comment on it. Uh, at least I like to just think that in my role, I just gave Jack something that he could use, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that was good for him to use. But that's really like his tone. And I learned a lot about tone on that record from Jack, like things that I wouldn't have done. When I would run through, a, through an amp, I my thing was that I'd like to run through a Fender Twin, which I still like to do. And there's sort of a tuba kind of a sound you can get off of that. But like, I'd never thought about running bass through an AC30 and I wouldn't have thought anything in particular about it. But just sort of watching the things that he would set up and like not even necessarily talking about it a whole lot, but just sort of like being a fly on his wall for a minute. I learned a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have thought of on my own and uh, I probably use more of than I'm conscious of. <laughs>